rights, 
it can give rise to remedies under the Charter. But only if the rights in question are contained in the Charter, and only if the government can't justify it as a reasonable limit under Section 1. And so the really big question for both of these individuals is, is there a right to housing under the Charter that has been violated? Now, the starting point is that we do not have an explicit right to housing in Canada. Other countries do. This is the language from the South African Constitution, where they say, you have a right to housing, you can't be evicted from your house, but the state needs to take steps to make sure that everybody has a house. We don't have language like this in the Canadian Charter. But that hasn't stopped Canadian lawyers from arguing that other sections of the Charter include implicitly a right to housing. And two sections have been key here. Section 7, which protects life, liberty, and the security of the person. And Section 15, which guarantees that everyone has equality before and under the law. And so you might be wondering, have these crafty Canadian lawyers succeeded in arguing that there is a right to housing in the Canadian Charter? And the answer is only in the most limited sense. Okay? I want to talk first about our single mother who's spending her entire social benefit on rent. Uh, her name was Jennifer Kuniyaya. She was one of four individual plaintiffs who sued the government of Ontario and the federal government. All four were living with various degrees of housing insecurity. Uh, one was homeless, the other three didn't have adequate affordable housing. Now they argued that both levels of government, the government of Ontario and the federal government, had taken a number of steps since the 1990s that exacerbated the housing insecurity of people living in Ontario. What did they point to? They pointed to cuts in social assistance. They pointed to cuts in employment insurance. They pointed to scaling back of new affordable housing projects. They pointed to the policy that both governments had adopted of deinstitutionalizing individuals with mental health issues, with mental disabilities, without providing them with sufficient support once they were out of the community. They also pointed to various procedures that the provincial government had adopted that made it easier for landlords to evict tenants. And they argued that all of these actions taken together violated Section 7 and Section 15 of the Charter. And what were they asking for? What was the remedy that they wanted? Well, they wanted a declaration from the court that the Charter rights had been violated. But they also wanted the court to order the government to put together a housing strategy. The housing strategy was supposed to be put together with affected people. It was supposed to have timelines that needed to be met measures so we knew whether or not the government was succeeding. And they wanted the court to oversee that strategy to make sure that the government complied with them. Now, they were unsuccessful. They were unsuccessful at the outset of their lawsuit uh, in front of the Ontario Superior Court. Uh, the government successfully argued that there was no reasonable chance of the plaintiffs succeeding there. So they didn't even need to have a hearing on the merits. It got punted out of uh, that decision was upheld by the Ontario Court of Appeal, and I want to explain to you why. Okay, so first, Section 7. For the plaintiffs to succeed under Section 7, they would have to show that the government action, this big raft of different policies, deprived individuals of life, made them more likely to die. Liberty, which means things like personal autonomy, the right to make choices about important personal topics, or security of person, which really goes to physical and psychological well-being. So they'd have to show that the government actions amounted to a deprivation of these things, and that the deprivation violated what's called a principle of fundamental justice. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit more about that later on. But even if they could show this, the government still has the ability to show that yes, there's a violation, but it's a reasonable limit. So Section 1 always gives the government the right to say, or the opportunity to say, yes, there's a violation, but it's not a charter route, 
this is a reasonable one. The plaintiffs here uh, failed at the first step of this analysis. Why? At the Ontario Court, that Superior Court, so the lower level court said, what you are saying here is not that the government has deprived people of these things, but that the government hasn't done enough to provide people with life, liberty, and security of course. They're saying you're arguing that there's some sort of positive obligation put on the government. And that's not what the Charter does, according to the Ontario Superior Court. All the Charter does is say that you can't interfere, you can't take actions that um, would uh, reduce somebody's liberty, would reduce their security in person. But that's not what's happening here. You're just saying that the government hasn't done enough to ensure these things. So they were unsuccessful with their Section 7, uh, their Section 7 analysis. What about Section 15? So to succeed on Section 15, they would have had to show that the government was treating people unequally and that unequal treatment was premised on a prohibited ground. What do I mean by prohibited ground? Well, you can't discriminate against people based on uh, certain grounds that are set out in the Charter. That includes things like their race, their national origin, their religion, their sex, their age. But you also can't discriminate. It's not a closed list. Courts have said you can't discriminate against people on any ground that is comparable to these ones that we've set up in the chart. Okay? There were a couple of different Section 15 arguments here, um, but the one that I want to talk about is homelessness. The plaintiffs tried to argue that being homeless was a comparable ground. And the court said, we disagree. We're not going to find that homelessness is a comparable ground. It's too diverse a group of people to treat uh, in the same way as we would a gender group or a racial group. We can't really identify who is or who isn't homeless because it's such a diverse group of people. So Ontario uh, Superior Court finds no Section 7 breach, no Section 15 breach. The plaintiffs appeal, and on appeal, what the Ontario Court of Appeal says is, you're not really asking us a legal question. The, the heart of your argument is that governments haven't made housing an important enough priority. That's a political question. That's not a legal question. We're not going to weigh in on it. So the term for this is they said this isn't a justiciable issue. This is not justiciable. Uh, the plaintiffs then applied for leave to the Supreme Court of Canada, and the Supreme Court of Canada declined to hear case. So the Ontario Court of Appeal uh, had the last word on What about our homeless individual who's sleeping in a public park? So they have erected uh, tents without applying for a uh, permit. They're charged with violating a city bylaw. Um, and the city then actually brings an application to uh, remove individuals from the public park. Um, there was, th this is an issue that has been litigated a couple of different times. It's been litigated in Victoria. The most recent decision is from Abbotsford. And the cases in Abbotsford were um, quite difficult. It had become a very tense situation. The municipal government had taken very aggressive actions to try and force uh, the homeless individuals out of their park, including at one point uh, spraying all their tents and lawns in the they then turned to the courts to apply to uh, remove the homeless people from camping in the park. And there was an organization representing the homeless people who brought a counter application seeking a declaration from the court that the city bylaws preventing them from sleeping in the park uh, violated the charter. Okay? Um, and again, the charter violations that they pointed to were Section 7 and Section so we know what you need to succeed on Section 7. You have to show first that the government has deprived individuals of life, liberty, or security of person. And here the court found that that stage of the analysis 
and, and how did they reach that conclusion? Well, the first thing they did was they said, do these individuals need to be sleeping? Are there other places that they could go and be housed? Are there shelter spots? And there was some evidence provided by the city that shelters were not completely full, that there were spaces in shelters. But the court looked at those spaces and said, um, are they actually accessible to this population? And, and one of the pieces of uh, information that they looked at was that a number of the shelters had sobriety requirements. So you could only stay there if you were um, not under the influence of drugs or alcohol. There was evidence before the court that a number of the individuals sleeping in the park had uh, alcohol and drug addictions. And on that basis, the court said, even though there are shelter spaces, they are not actually accessible to this population. So this population essentially has no choice but to sleep in the park. They then said, okay, if you have a group of people who have no choice to sleep, uh, but to sleep in the park, that's their only shelter, does it deprive them of life, liberty, or security of a person when we say you can't have a tenant? And the court said yes, it does. It provides them of security of person, it impacts their psychological and physical well-being because you are forcing them to sleep in a park of other conditions if they can't live. Um, they also said that it impacts their living right because you are preventing them from making the decision to shelter themselves. That is a key personal topic, and you're interfering with their autonomy. Okay. Um, did it violate a principle of fundamental justice? Right, that's the section of the stage of the analysis. They said, yes, it violates two. One principle of fundamental justice is, if you have a law that is aimed at achieving an uh, objective, that's fine, but it can't be written so broadly that it creates unnecessary harm. Likewise, they said, you always have to look at the aim of a law vis a be the harm that it is creating. And if the harm is grossly disproportionate to the aim of the law, that violates the principle of fundamental justice. Here they said, you know what, these bylaws have an important aim. What is the aim of the bylaws? To make sure that everybody can make use of the public parks. Right? And there was evidence that these homeless encampments were interfering with people's ability to use the public park. How? Well, first, they were taking up space, right, that other people could use. Second, there was evidence that the permanent encampment was damaging the park. Trees were being damaged, the ground was being torn up. Third, there was evidence that the homeless encampment was creating a nuisance that discouraged other people from using the park. There was litter, there were used needles, and there was a uh, rat infestation. DC, though, of course, wouldn't be a thing over now. Um, but they said, you know, there, there is an aim here that is important. We want other people to be able to use the park. The homeless encampment is interfering with that. But the law is written too broadly. Why? Because we could allow people to erect tents every night as long as they took them down in the morning. Um, and then let people use the park during the day. So what the court did, uh, it then went on and found there's no reasonable limit here. So uh, the, the government can't win on section one. So they said, yes, there's a section seven violation here. How do we fix that? We, re we rewrite the bylaw to say, you need a permit if you are erecting a tent during the day. If you're erecting a tent between the hours of seven o'clock in the evening and nine o'clock in the morning, do not need a permit to do. Okay? What about section 15? Or se section 15 arguments again. Um, and again, they tried to say that homelessness was a comparable ground, and the court said, no, we've read the reasons from Ontario, we're convinced homelessness is not a comparable ground. So if we look at these two cases, what we see is that the Charter has had very limited success in providing people with any kind of right to housing. Instead of a right to housing, what the Charter has provided us with is a right to erect a temporary shelter overnight 
when sleeping in a public park if there are no adequate alternative shelter spaces. Okay? That's pretty limited. This is um, part of a bigger problem that certain people have identified with the charter that it has been very uh, anemic. It's been very unsuccessful in providing what are called economic and social rights, especially to marginalized populations. And you can see in these cases a number of different ways that the charter falls down. Section 7, we're told there's no positive right to life, liberty, and as a person. All there is is the right not to have the government actively interfere with those things. We're told that Section 15 um, doesn't provide protection to uh, homeless as a group of people. There have been a number of similar cases where poverty has been argued as an analogous ground, and the court has said being poor is not a homeless ground, is not a comparable ground. And finally, the idea of non-justiciability, that the court um, doesn't want to get involved in what it perceives as political issues, that it leaves those to the political arena. Um, that was the note that I was going to end this talk on, but it seemed very dire. So I want to give you a little bit of hope, because I do think that there is the ability to achieve change in the political arena. And we saw this this past year with the National Housing Strategy Act. So this is a new piece of federal legislation that recognizes, um, it recognizes that the federal government's housing strategy should be informed by a recognition that people have a right to housing. Now this is not the same as a charter right to housing. Why not? Well, it doesn't give individuals any ability to challenge federal legislation, right? All it does is it informs uh, the federal government when it's putting together its national housing strategy. There's a bit of an accountability mechanism where they appoint somebody called a federal housing advocate who oversees the strategy, who makes sure that the government is setting out goals and then meeting those goals. It should sound a lot like what they're asking for in Tunisia, right? Uh, they wanted a strategy, they wanted somebody to oversee. So that's been achieved through the National Housing Strategy Act. There's no enforcement goal. It's also a piece of legislation, right? So it could be um, legislated out of existence by a future government. It's also a federal piece of legislation. So unlike the charter, it doesn't bind the provincial government and it doesn't bind other levels of government like the or other public bodies like the So there's some success here. There's been some success achieved by people taking up what the Ontario Court of Appeals said, which is you need to head to the political realm. You can't do this through the legal realm. Um, but if you're looking just at the charter for the right to house more, there's really a little, little reason for hope there, uh, for lack of a better way of ending. Um, and in fact, I'd love to hear your guys' questions about that. Sorry to interrupt, but could you repeat the question because it oh. was difficult to hear back here. Uh, I will try and do justice to the question. Uh, <coughs> let me know if I've missed something. The question was, um, what would I suggest uh, doing to try and see greater recognition for um, these sorts of uh, 
rights, housing rights, uh, rights that are important to people who are uh, impoverished, and class is sort of comparable to them. Does that capture what you said? Yes. Okay. Um, and uh, like I said, one, one answer is the political uh, realm, and you said, but what about, what about justice? And that's a really important question. And I guess the answer is um, these things are going to continue to be litigated. And uh, hopefully, at some point, uh, the law will evolve. And, and you can already see some reason for hope. Um, in the Ontario Court of Appeal decision, there was a long dissent that said not, yes, there is a violation here, but we should at least hear the merits of what's going on. Um, and, and that was uh, an important aspect of the uh, Tenugaya case. There was a lot of evidence that the court could have looked at. The applicants had put together uh, 17 binders of evidence uh, establishing the different ways that this legislation um, deprived people of housing. And because the matter was thrown out on a preliminary basis, the court never so we have a dissent saying, um, yes, uh, we should be looking at this. And in doing so, they pointed to a potential opening um, from a previous case about uh, social benefits called Gosselin. And in Gosselin, that was a Supreme Court of Canada case, one of the uh, justices had written a set of reasons that said, Section 7 may provide positive obligations, may put positive obligations on the government in special circumstances. And one of the things that the dissent in Tenuyaya said was, we don't know if there are special circumstances here because we need to look at the evidence before we determine that, right? That's why we need to go to a hearing on the Now, as litigation continues on these matters, um, it is possible that the analysis will evolve and that we will see some sort of positive obligation. One of the other things that the um, dissent said in Tenugaya was the Constitution is a living tree. It needs to respond to social realities. One of the social realities is a lack of power. And so if, if we're not addressing that to our terms, that's not. Um, so law is a slow and process. Tenu Yaya seems like a pretty decisive case at this point in time, but that doesn't mean that there's not uh, the possibility of uh, that in the future, which is why we're going to Yes? A quick question. <clears throat> Regarding Section 15 and comparable grounds, it seems like there's a kind of fundamental flaw in how that's calculated, um, and there's Ontario uh, 
basically is, yes, these people are subject to disproportionate levels of housing, or homeless insecurity and housing insecurity, but there's no evidence that that disproportionate impact is as a result of government policy. In fact, government policy is supposed to help people uh, be more housing secure, and so you can't point to it as the source of that uh, disproportionate representation. The Ontario Court of Appeal in dissent, so the dissenting reasons, said this is yet another reason why we need to look at those 17 binders of evidence. Because we can't say that the government policy isn't responsible until we actually look at the government policy and figure out what kind of impact it is having on these different groups. In the Shams case, um, so this is the uh, homeless people in the park and the city bylaw, there was a bunch of evidence before the court about how that bylaw disproportionately impacted people living with addictions and Aboriginal. And in that case, um, maybe because he had already found a Section 7 breach, and so he didn't need to find a Section 15 breach, he provided, the judge provided very short reasons where he said, there's no discrimination here because the bylaw um, applies to everybody equally. Uh, which makes me think of that famous quote that the law in all its great majesty prohibits both rich men and poor men from sleeping under bridges. Um, Yes, that law applies equally, but it has a very disparate impact on people depending on who they are. So I, I think that's a real criticism of the Section 15 analysis, that, that lack of intersectional thinking in both cases. Other questions? Uh, yes. I'm just wondering, how do uh, things we consider desirable transition into becoming rights? Uh, charter rights, specifically? <laughs> Change the charter. You can change the charter, though, as as you know, if you were a Canadian in the nineties, um, as well. Um, one argument that was advanced without much success in both cases was that we need to look at international instruments that Canada has signed on to and use those to interpret our charter. And so Canada has signed on to a number of international legal agreements that um, include the right to housing. And uh, the argument of the plaintiffs in both cases was, look, obviously Canada thinks the right to housing is important. They have said so in all these international agreements. And we need to view our own charter through that lens. Um, that didn't carry a lot of weight with the court. Uh, they looked to previous Canadian decisions um, that uh, hadn't found under Section 17 that hadn't found poverty as an analogous right, and they saw those as more persuasive. But that's one of the ways that you can make arguments about how our charter rights need to change. Uh, yes? Some of this is the result of the illness. I wonder if the charter is really the place to address issues of that. I think that um, the answer is no and yes. Sorry, is, the, is charter the right place to address issues of mental illness? Um, I think that there were a lot of other places that, uh, that issues around mental illness can be tackled and need to be tackled. Um, I think what people find, some people find really difficult about these sorts of decisions is that the Charter is one of the foundational building blocks of, of Canada. And the fact that it doesn't seem to be providing, uh, as, as the previous person said, justice to some of our most marginalized groups is seen as deeply problematic. So is it the right place, or is it the only place to tackle issues around mental illness? No, I think there's a lot of other avenues. The fact that it doesn't seem to um, provide any sort of legal remedy for people who are uh, marginalized in society, marginalized in political processes, uh, who really only have the court. That, that seems problematic to a lot of people. Other questions? Yes. I may be off on my tag. It seems to me that this is really more complex 
when it comes to peace. Like this is downtown Hamilton. This is the high rise of the city. And you have guidelines and considerations at the planning department. You have guidelines at safety council. You have guidelines at the developer. You have guidelines here. And unless you have everybody on the same page, how do you ever get anything built that does the affordable housing uh, and uh, is going to provide <coughs> what society feels it needs? Yeah. Well, and that was one of the concerns that uh, both levels of court in Ontario had in the Penny case was the breadth of what they were being asked to consider. Charter litigation tends to be more like the Shamps case, where you are pointing to discrete laws or discrete government acts and saying, this one law, this one act violates my right. Whereas in Tenuyaya, what they were asked, what the court was being asked to look at was the breadth of provincial and federal policy in all these different arenas. I mentioned a couple some. The court also said, you know, we wouldn't have to stop there. We would have to look at planning law. We would have to look at uh, mortgage regulation if we really want to dig down into this. And how are we supposed to do that as a court, right? That's really something that is better suited to uh, the political arena. And, and that's why the Ontario Court of Appeal at least said this, this isn't an issue. So your intuition there is, is exactly one of the, the reasons that informs the Ontario Court of Appeal decision. So because this is a lecture period, mm -hmm. how do you uh, get them to make the changes? Me personally? Um, <laughs> vote. Uh, vote. <laughs> talk to your uh, talk to the people who are around you in your constituency, tell them that this is an important issue for you, um, and find out where they stand on And then it doesn't end when you finish voting, right? Write to your um, representative. There are, I am going to flag here, I just want to make sure that I get the language right. So under the National Housing Strategy, there is both the Federal Housing Advocate, which I mentioned already, that's the person who's going to oversee the National Housing Strategy and make sure that it's carried out. There's also something called the National Housing Council. And this is intended to be an advisory body made up of members of the public who are going to help the federal government putting together their uh, National Housing Strategy. They are currently um, recruiting members. So if that is something that you're interested in, uh, Google National Housing Strategy, and the information will be there about how to um, put your name forward to be part of that council. Yes, way in the back. So it, just a couple of questions. So you mentioned um, that the charter hasn't necessarily gone a long way in supporting a right to housing. And I guess I would ask what your thoughts are on the sections related to discrimination, because I would suggest that perhaps um, the charter actually has helped a lot of people access housing by protecting them against discrimination from landlords and whoever else. So that's one part. The second part that, that I was just wondering about is the case in Abbotsford was around the ability, um, your right to be able to put up shelter and the government's restriction to your right to put up shelter. The first one in Ontario though seemed to me to be as much about income and money as anything else because it, it may not have been exactly. So um, when we say access to housing, our right to housing, there is the component of the right to somewhere to, having the right to have somewhere to go to. And then there's the ability to pay for whatever that is, which is part and parcel. So I, I, I'm trying to wrap it up in my head. I'm just wondering if you can help maybe tease some of that out or how that might apply to the charter as opposed to just the right to housing. It's a huge part of it's the income to pay for it, regarding, regardless of the affordability. Um, I, I want to be clear about your first question. I, I think what you might be asking about is uh, the Alberta Human Rights Act, which prevents landlords from discriminating against tenants, uh, condo boards from discriminating against people. So that's a, that's a separate yep. piece of legislation. And, and you're right, that does prevent housing providers from discriminating against people based on things like race, gender, family composition, those, those sorts of things. And that's an incredibly important piece of it. Um, legislation, it's separate and apart from the charter. Uh, your second question, uh, isn't this really about income? And uh, 
it, to a large extent, yes. Um, when we talk about affordable, or sorry, when we talk about housing, uh, and we talk about what does it mean to have uh, an acceptable level of housing, right? there's a bunch of different metrics that you can look at. Um, the Canadian Housing and Mortgage Corporation has come up with a definition that looks at three different metrics. One is affordability. Are you spending more than 30% of your pre-tax income on housing? One is um, suitability. Does your house have enough space for the number of people in your household? And one is acceptability, which looks at the condition of your housing. Is it um, habitable? Are there major repairs that need to be made to it? Um, so you're right. There are different components to what makes housing acceptable. And for most people, if you take a look at the statistics, uh, people who don't meet those three criteria, most of them don't meet it for reasons of affordability. So, so the idea of income and, and housing are very closely tied, which is why a lot of people who wrote about um, the Tanguyaya decision in particular said, you know, we're talking about homelessness here. We've talked about poverty in other cases. What we're really talking about is, is class and we need to recognize class as <coughs> Yeah. Just on that last question. Um, it does seem like at an individual level, there's not a lot of recourse to the, to the charter when it comes to housing housing. I'm wondering, are you aware of any instances um, or cases that have been a more systematic challenge? So thinking of a municipality or a neighborhood uh, refusing to open a shelter, refusing to allow a certain type of Housing. Uh, do you think that that ends up having the same relationship to the charter? Where you have seen municipalities involved in um, something that sort of edges towards that is that there has been a bunch of litigation in BC around the Shams issue. And um, usually it is municipalities who are trying to. Force out homeless camps. And one of the remedies that the homeless camps have sometimes, or the um, organizations representing the homeless individuals have sometimes asked for, is something like more affordable housing or addiction treatment or safe injection sites. Um, that's the only case that I've seen uh, those sorts of issues arisen, that have arisen. Um, and in most of those cases, uh, the decisions that you see are at the injunction stage where the uh, city is saying, we want an, an injunction, which is a court order saying, you have to do something or you have to start to do something. And so the injunction is usually a uh, homeless camp, you have to move on, right? And the response has been, um, they shouldn't get an injunction because there's a potential breach of our charter here. And so you shouldn't make a court order until you decide the charter issue. And then the court has to decide, is the case for uh, the injunction strong enough that it should override the potential charter breach? Um, and given the narrowness of the protection found in chance, usually the injunction is So, if there ever was an instance where the court did say that housing was a, a positive right, or I guess any positive right, uh, would you anticipate then that the court would have to define what that positive right actually looked like? Or would you anticipate the court kicking that back to governments to decide what that looks like. And if it's the latter, aren't you just arguing for non the non-justifiable uh, ruling? Yeah. Well, that was something that the, um, the Ontario Court of Appeals struggled with in, uh, in the Tenuyaya case was how do you even define a community security, right? And I think that they, I think that they would likely adopt a remedy like the Tanya remedy, where they say, um, government, you go figure it out, but you need to provide us with some plan, and we are going to oversee your adherence to the plan. I think that's probably the most you're going to get. Um, but the, and the difficulty around remedy is part of what makes these cases difficult. Right? Courts tend to be very reticent that are going to have fiscal consequences for government. And it's hard to imagine 
a remedy that recognizes a adequate right to housing without a huge fiscal consequence. Um, one thing that I think is kind of interesting is the language in South Africa's constitution. Um, section 2 tells us that the state must take reasonable legislative and other measures within its available resources to achieve the progressive realization of this right. So it's not saying everybody gets a house tomorrow, but we need to see you making some sort of progress towards it, having regard for the fact that financial resources and any government. Other questions? Yes. How do you reconcile the Shannon's decision where the court just said, we can put up a tent overnight versus um, some of the other language talking about adequate housing. Um, is it sufficient just for the city to say, okay, here's a bunch of tents, for example, and that that's adequate? Well, the city didn't even need to supply the tents, right? Like, all the right was was to put a tent up overnight. And I mean, the key element there was that they were trying to balance these two interests, right? The right to use a public park and uh, the need to shelter yourself overnight when you're sleeping in a public park. Um, sorry, did that address your question? Well, so just talking about the other parts of the, like the National um, Strategy Act and, and so on, um, where it talks specifically about adequate housing. Yeah. Um, if there's any thoughts that you have about what that would mean if that's been fleshed out in any other way? Well, I think it's it, it sort of going to the last couple of questions. It is a difficult question that looks at a number of different factors. Um, and so coming up with the definition of what adequate housing means is, is going to be a really important part of what the National Housing Strategy does. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that the Federal Housing Act is um, tasked with is carrying out research. And, and I can imagine that being a big part of what they look into as sort of a threshold issue. How is the right to housing relevant to your practice? <laughs> I feel like such a blinded question. <laughs> so I, I'm really interested in debtor creditor law, and I've been thinking a lot about um, foreclosures and judgment enforcement. When you don't pay your creditors and they sue you and they get a court order and you can't pay the court order and they start seizing your property, which can include your personal property but also your house. So I've been thinking a lot about um, those areas of law, and there's a lot of really neat case law coming out of South Africa where those areas of law have been viewed through the right to housing. And courts have said, creditors, there are limits on when you can enforce your rights because we need to preserve people's right to housing. And I thought to myself, aha, I wonder if there's similar arguments to be made in Canada based on our charter. Um, based on my research thus far, the answer is no. <laughs> but, but that is where my interest in the area. Thank you for the question. Other questions? Tim? Um, so, just to circle back uh, to some other comments about provincial human rights legislation and things like that, I, I mean, it seems to me that um, maybe one of the issues that the courts have in terms of in, in applying the Charter to the issue of the right to housing is that maybe there's a perception that the, the Charter is a pretty blunt instrument to use in that instance, and it is sort of undefined in terms of a right. Um, and so I wonder what you think about perhaps the strategy of picking away at the edges um, through, for example, using human rights legislation. I know there's some decisions here in Alberta in the provincial court um, related to interpreting the Residential Tenancies Act in light of the Human Rights Act, specifically on the issue of hoarding and the psychological condition and non-discrimination. Um, and so I wonder what you think about maybe using that strategy to, as I say, kind of maybe define the parameters and maybe down the road there might be more of an appetite um, to use the charter uh, once once it's more defined. Yeah. For, for those of you who don't know, Tim is one of the staff lawyers at the Edmonton Community Legal Center, which is an organization in town that provides um, legal advice to low-income Edmontonians and handles, as you can imagine, a lot of residential tenancy litigation. Um, I think that there is a lot of wisdom in that strategy, going back to the idea of the living tree and how you get the court to expand its interpretation of uh, existing charter rights. I think the more that you can point to domestic cases where similar arguments have succeeded, that's going to be really beneficial. In both of these cases, uh, there was a lot of um, 
the, the applicants who were trying to get the housing right recognized argued a lot of foreign cases. So they put a bunch of South African cases before the court. They put cases from India before the court. And it was very easy for the court to say, yes, they recognize the right to housing there, but it's in their constitution. We don't have anything in the constitution. Right? They were able to differentiate on those grounds. But the more that it is a domestic body of case law recognizing the right to housing in comparable areas like um, human rights legislation, I think that that is going to help inform the evolution of the Other questions? How much do we have Okay. Avery. Um, thanks for that. Um, uh, carrying on with, uh, with some of the, the idea of picking the way and also the comments I've heard on, the, on the issues of mental illness, I'm trying to formulate <coughs> is there an angle to be made about um, breach of Section 7 when mental health facilities, and we, we saw the opposite of this this summer with the Q, QB decision on against health services, but we know that mental health facilities routinely discharge people to homelessness, um, either um, effectively because they simply discharge them knowing that they have no place to live, or they send them to a shelter which they know um, they won't they won't be permanent housing, or they know that the person is incapable of, of uh, maintaining. Them. So there's there's knowledge. Uh, but it seems to me that the state in those circumstances is when they knowingly do that, seriously interfering with the person. Yeah. Any comments about that? I um I think that there probably is a argument to be made there, and I think probably that argument doesn't get made very often in court because charter litigation is expensive, it is not straightforward. And the people whose rights are being violated are not well positioned to carry it out, right? I think the reason that we see a lot of um, litigation coming out of BC is because you have organizations in BC like Pivot Legal Services. Um, the Abbotsford and Chance case was uh, was argued by Pivot Legal Services, which is an organization working in the downtown east side on issues around homelessness, around drug addiction, around um, prostitution. And that's incredibly important because these are complex cases to put together. They are complex legally, they are complex factually, and most people who are in those situations don't have the work to talk to advance them themselves. Any other questions? Yes? I was just earlier about shelters. I'm not sure how shelters should be used positively as a shelter because you can't leave anything there. They can't they have no place to keep any body. They have they can't stay there during the day. They can only stay there for a very limited time frame. How do they actually I mean we're saying it's okay to live on the streets for all but six hours a night. And and I, I don't see how that can be called as a shelter. No, I, I agree with you. It was an extremely narrow um, recognition of the right uh, that, that I think a lot of people have found very unsatisfactory. Um, a lot of, I, I mentioned that there's been a lot of litigation around injunctions following that, and in a number of those cases there has been an argument that we need to expand the recognition of the right to include the right to put up a more permanent shelter, um, raising some of the issues that you've identified, where do you leave your belongings, what if you're sleeping during the day? Um, where do you go during the day? Uh, there hasn't been much movement on that. Uh, they haven't got to the, the merit stage. It's, it's been this injunction stage. Um, but, but that is an argument that lawyers are making. Shall we wrap up, Kat? Well, I, on behalf of the uh, group, I would like to thank you very much for letting us know what the charter cannot do. Since you know at large, I think you probably learned a lot about the charter and learning what it cannot do. So I want to thank you very much for a very, very informative uh, talk.
And uh, I guess, you know, you've given us a bit of an invitation to think about this issue. Housing is a huge issue uh, in Canada, and it's interesting that our charter is not, as I said, a, it's a blunt instrument. And uh, human rights legislation, of course, can be changed. It's not like the charter, so uh, it's going to be something we need to look at. But overall strategies we need to address. So thank you very much, and thank you for attending. The next